So I'd like to introduce Alex Bogusky. I think his reputation precedes him quite a bit, but I want to cover off some just basics. Uh, Alex joined Crispin Porter Advertising in 1989 as an art director. He became the creative director five years later, a partner in 1997, and co-chairman in January 2008. Congrats. Thanks. Under Alex's direction, Crispin Porter and Bogusky has grown to more than 900 employees with offices in Miami, Boulder, Los Angeles, and London. Alex's work has won hundreds of top industry awards, including the Grand Prix at Cannes International Ad Festival, in all five categories, which is a big deal. Sales promotion, media, cyber, titanium, and film. Alex was inducted into the American Ad Federation's Hall of Achievement in 2002. And a little tidbit I got background from some of the people that work with Alec is that most Mondays he comes to work with at least one grisly, bloody, oozing injury that forces people to look away, and he has a photographic memory, but only for ads. So he's kind of a weekend warrior, but he has a warrior during, warrior during the week as well. So please welcome Alex Bogusky. <laughs> just to so we pretend they're not here. Yeah, so right? it's just you and me. Right. So what I'm going to do is we're going to open up with a couple questions. <laughs> Should we look longingly yeah. into each other's eyes? Okay. Um, we're going to have two questions that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I get that a lot. A lot of people look at me that way. <laughs> it's usually agency people who want my business, though. That's what's going on. Mm. Maybe that's what's happening. <laughs> he was a gentleman. He you are a client, after all. He, he was a gentleman. He did not ask one question about my business when I picked him at the airport. Well, we tend to compete maybe a little bit. Well, you have, but you have Domino's and Pizza Hut, which True. could Why be a conflict. Yeah. Yeah. You could just exactly. add more QSRs, and who cares exactly. about conflicts? All right. Uh, one of the questions uh, that was pre-submitted, what tips do you have to successfully integrate media planning into the creative process? Tips for integrating media planning into the, the um, I guess, the, I guess the, the thing that we do there is we actually don't really have any process for that. But um, one thing we've done recently is we actually have put media and planning more together. Not like uh, our COG group, like the uh, agency planning, the research group. And, and uh, that sort of moves media a little earlier in the process, which I think is, is kind of key. Can, but but can in general. Chaos, can I interject one question? Can no, chaos be part of the process? Of well, that? Not overly having a process about something. I think I think what what yeah, and I think what what happens is if you have uh, creative people who are interested in media, um, you know, we have a reputation for creative media, but it doesn't necessarily come from the creative department coming to the creative or the media department coming to the creative department saying, "Hey, we've got these ideas. You know, can you fill them?" It it tends to be more from a tactical place like. Hey, we have to reach business people. We can't really afford to do it. What if we somehow hijack those in-room videos, right? And and uh, and so that's where the ideas come from. And they're they're largely they can be from account people, they can be from media people, or they can be from creative people. We don't really care. Um, since you've recently just won the Microsoft business, here's one about Microsoft. Microsoft has a reputation in parens. Many would say it is deserved, on parens, of using its size and ubiquity to force people to deal with shoddy products. <laughs> parens, for example, this sounds like a, a joke at a, an insider joke at a plumber's convention, but I'll work my way through it. For example, IE still forces web developers. Two, two maintenance guys are on it. <laughs> or Steve Martin, old Steve Martin joke. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for example, IE still forces web developers to utilize dozens of hacks to make their style sheets work due to its lack of support for W3C standard, unparens. Is hiring your firm really just an expensive way to try to convince us that the emperor does have clothes? Yeah, I mean, I'm lucky in that I don't have any idea what that means. <laughs> so, yeah. So no, you got no answer for that one. I I have no idea. What it means. <laughs> okay. All right. So, can I? Who wrote that question? Can somebody explain that? Okay, go <laughs> Help us out here, dude. Basically, though, you can cascade style sheets for HTML. Um, I'm already lost. For web designers. Yeah.
Right. So we're make. I mean, there's going to be some changes where seven and six are going to be integrated into the um, composite algorithms. I made that up. I don't know what. I mean. <laughs> it sounded good though. It was kind of going for a while. Worked for me. I was totally like, yeah, uh, yeah. Huh? Uh, I don't know. Uh, that's great. Well, uh, you know, instead of me pelting with questions, sure. What are some of what are some of the things that are in your mind, top of mind, that you got going on? Things that are going on that are on my mind. I think you need to ask questions. <laughs> well, he did come with some prepared I've had materials. Years. I have very little on my mind. Um, I brought some stuff. I could show some stuff, and maybe that'll like spark some, some questions. I, yeah. Um, I mean, one of, one of the things that, that we spend a lot of time talking about at the agency is prove it, don't uh, say it. And uh, I think a lot of advertising says a lot of things, um, but not that uh, it's difficult to, to prove things. Um, and uh, we, were, we were assigned with the, uh, I think it was the, the, uh, the 50th anniversary of the Whopper, which hamburgers, you're familiar with hamburgers. I think I know a little bit about them. And, yes. uh, and, and we, had a, we had a claim that uh, people love the Whopper more than any other burger. I'm sorry to tell you this, but um, <laughs> it's apparently a fact. And, uh, and, and it's a, it's a, but it's a difficult thing to just say, right? Yeah. And, and so we, we had this idea. We were kind of inspired by deprivation experiments. And we had this idea, what if we went into a Burger King and we removed the Whopper? And we uh, told people that the uh, Whopper was gone and would never be back. Um, M might, might that experiment prove that people are passionate about it? And, and uh, you know, our client at Burger King is really courageous. And I think that, in general, when you go to a client, you say, we want to remove your starring product from, from one of your locations. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily, it's not a great meeting, right? And, and uh, we had other ideas as well. And, and, and most of our meetings are like that. We don't tend to. Um, go into a meeting with, with one idea. We'll go in with a few ideas. And uh, all of them, n not necessarily different levels of creativity, because we don't really think that way, all of them uh, strategically around the same idea, uh, but just accomplishing it in different ways. And so it, we really never wind up in, people say, hey, how do you sell such and such? You know, how'd you sell that? Um, but we never, I don't think we ever find ourselves in a position where we'll se we're selling something. We just present all the ideas and then we have conversations about it. And I always find that, that I learn during the presentation, right? I might go in there thinking, God, I kind of think this is the best idea. And then during the presentation, yeah, and you have to be totally honest too with your clients. So during the presentation, I may realize there's something really broken about one of the ideas. And during the presentation, you might say, you know, I love this idea before we started talking about it, but here's the fatal flaw with this, and we need to actually just even take it off the table. And, and that kind of honest conversation, I think, is a big reason why we're able to, you know, have the relationships we have that, that make clients comfortable with what could be considered risky. I mean, to me, what's risky is when you spend a lot of money for no effect. Um, and I think the concept of risky, not risky with an advertising is probably kind of upside down. But uh, so, that, so, so we, we called this thing Whopper Freakout. And we have a, a little video that, that we can show that kind of outlines some of what happened. It's funny, because we, uh, at Jack in the Box, we talked about it when it, when it, doing, doing this? When it came out. No, just oh, and about just the talking work. about the, the Whopper Freakout. I thought you were going to say, we did it. Or yeah, we, we, we did, did we it. We talked about doing it. And we again. didn't really like it. The, and um, here's why. <laughs> No, I, we, but I thought it was uh, I, the, the deprivation angle was really, really a great insight. And because I mean, on every every Burger King sign is home of the Whopper. Yeah. You know, so it's such a it's such an endemic part of the brand. To kind of mess with it, it was yeah. it was such a uh, I think such a, a fresh thought that you know to be honest, I'm not very complimentary about advertising in general. And I hate advertising. Definitely about not about. Actually, QSR, which has typically been more, more a very moribund advertising category over the last you know three decades or however long it's been around, um, but I think you know Jack and Box work, but also the Burger King work has really proven you can do 
interesting work in what is not probably the most, most sexiest of categories. Yeah, sometimes. and Jack in the Box work was great before Burger King work got good. You know, I remember <laughs> the, the, first, the first time, true. it's true, the first time I was on a Burger King shoot, we were shooting um, Subservient Chicken and we were shooting, there, were, there was broadcast that went with the web, you know, no one remembers the broadcast, but, uh, but there was, and, um, and on the set, one of the talents said to me, wow, this stuff's really funny. Like, when did Burger King start advertising? <laughs> See, that's risky. To me, that's risky. So it's like, other than last year when they spent $300 million, every year before that as well. Your point you said is that the risky thing is actually to be risk averse. Yeah. When you have a chance, and I had a client, he, he was a terrible client, but he, you know, every once in a while somebody says something bright, and you gotta, I, always, I always held on to it, and he said, you know what, it, it, media is a critical component, any type of media is a critical component of a marketing communications uh, program. But media is merely the stage you rent. The play is the, is, the, is the deal. So you better have a good play. If you're gonna spend a lot of money on a stage, you better have a decent play to put on. Yeah. And that's the one thing I think a lot of advertisers are, should be putting lock, locks over is that they, where they, sh they, should take a, they should take a chance, they don't. They wanna pull in and be conservative where that's the least thing you do after spending all this money getting get the stage. Yeah, and I think like today, is it really even that big a stage? You know, the, like broadcasts cost a lot of money, but, but uh, it, the term broadcast is pretty misleading when the, when the highest rated show is reaching, um, and in prime time, is reaching 2% of the audience. So, you know, nothing is very broadly cast. And, you know, something like this even, we look at it as, as uh, a way to drop catalyst into pop culture more than assuming that everyone will see this. We sort of kickstart ideas with broadcast, knowing that if it's, a, if it's the right idea, it's gonna exist online. We may, you know, there's some parodies, I think, that, that we're gonna show, too, that we didn't create, and we didn't have anything to do with, and we don't seed, and we don't do anything else with, but the right kind of catalyst gets that stuff going. Let's, wa let's watch this video now. Goes something like this. Hello, baby. Guess what these motherfuckers then did at Burger King? These motherfuckers then took away from the motherfucking Whopper. Heavens to Betsy. The Whopper. It's America's most beloved burger and has been for the past 50 years. But how do you prove love? Burger King decided to prove it by taking away the Whopper for one day in one town to see what would happen. What happened was the Whopper freakout. A town in middle America was chosen to serve as the stage for this day of deprivation. It was rigged with cameras inside and out. Trained actors posing as BK employees explained this new reality to unsuspecting patrons. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Andrew. I'm the manager of this particular Burger King. I apologize for the delay. I do need to let everyone know that the Whopper has been discontinued forever. The nature of our social experiment meant that we truly didn't know what would happen. Burger King went into it wondering, would this elaborate scheme really prove that people love the Whopper or just oh piss God. them off? They discontinued the Whopper. Thankfully, it did both. I need my Whopper. How about that? Whopper's are <laughs> <laughs> Like, that's it. Like. Unfortunately, we no longer have Whoppers. You cannot be serious. Is this a joke? To push the experiment further, we substituted a competitor's alternative for the Whopper. It's supposed to be a Whopper. Okay, that's a Wendy's burger. This ruse was not well received. I hate McDonald's. I hate Wendy's. A roving reporter armed with a local newspaper corroborating the story was hired to capture people's candid reactions to the discontinuation of the Whopper. The, the Burger King doesn't have the Whopper. They might, they might as well change their name to Burger Queen. Yeah. What are you going to put on the logo now? <laughs> yeah. Home of the whatever we got? After the experiment, it was decided to cut the hundreds of hours of footage into 15 and 30 second TV spots and audio from the drive through was turned into radio ads all of which would lead people to WhopperFreakOut.com, where a streaming eight-minute documentary of the experiment could be found.
Burger King's Whopper Freakout campaign is pulling the highest advertising recall numbers ever logged by IAG Research. Well, this started out as a stunt, but now it's become an internet sensation. Some folks began contributing to the hype with homemade freakout parodies. You just continued the Whopper? Oh my God. Burgers here anymore. Hey, how may I help you? Hey, young man, let me get a Whopper with no cheese. You mean you ain't got no Whoppers? This ain't no Burger King without no goddamn Whoppers. That's the best selling goddamn product y'all got. Y'all ain't got no motherfucking Whoppers. It is said that absence makes the heart grow fonder. But as Whopper Freakout proved, if you love something enough, absence actually makes you freak out. I just want my Whopper. You just want a triple Whopper. I want my Whopper. Get me a Whopper. Okay. Employees like actually threatened during that that whole the, thing. The guy that's kind of shaking, the last guy. right? Yeah, that last guy. He almost ran over some PAs like <laughs> exiting the parking lot and trying to, you know, we we loved his performance and so we really wanted to get him and, and uh, he finally calmed down enough. But he was hot for weeks, like really, <laughs> really hot. And finally, we got him to sign the release and kind of go along. And, you know, he makes some money and and he's a landscape photographer which was the thing that I thought was kind of interesting, you know? His deal is to go out in nature. I was guessing it's serial. <laughs> serene. I was guessing professional serial killer, but yeah. that's... Uh... Yeah, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. So, any so I mean, one of the things that was, that, was, that was obviously important to us about that is, is the fact that, the, you know, the right catalyst gets people to participate. And, and, uh, and, and they wind up coming to it from different directions. And no one really knows where. You know, people might say, hey, I saw that Whopper freakout thing. I don't think people necessarily know where they saw it. The first thing they may have seen may have been the parody, which led them to other stuff online. Or they may have gone to the site from, from, uh, from radio. And, and, and once it injects into culture like that, one of the, one of the nice things about it, it's not, it's not not real anymore. You know, it's got a, and, and it gets into press and stuff like that. It's got, it, it's more of an event, um, and it's got a certain authenticity because, hey, this is a real thing that we're all playing with, and it's kind of fun. Um, and that, that, that to me is what I, what I love about advertising, which I hate advertising. But what I, what I love about what some of what I get to do is you get to play with consumers and you get to play with pop culture. Where it takes on its own life to some degree. And it's it, just, it's just, it's a little bit, it's a little bit like, uh, like um, being in music or, or or other things where you just, you know, you get to just toy with pop culture, and that's fun. And you can steer it different directions, and you know, it's not, it's not uh, sinister that much, but um, but it's, but it's, it's just really fun. What would you say to clients? And like I read ad busters. I don't read the ad trades, but I like ad busters, right? So, and, and that's not everyone's way, you know. Some people are more into the, to the, uh, the craft of advertising. And, uh, you know, I like the craft of advertising, but I'm always thinking, like, well, how can the form sort of be different than it was? The, um, there's clients out there who are reticent to let, um, excuse me, consumers, get that out of here, get that out of here, uh, are reticent to let consumers take on, take on their brand. Yeah. You know, like that, and, but others, and that's a yeah. classic case of, letting the consumer take your brand and yeah. do with it what they may. To it's some terrifying, yeah. I think, be because if you think, uh, you know, some of the things that people do with the king, you know, we've got this king character and then you've got these king masks and people create their own work around it and some of it, obviously, you wouldn't necessarily produce as an agency. And, uh, but, it, but it is, what I would say is consumers play rough, but they're playing, right? When, 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 I was, when I was younger and I would go to Taco Bell, which I would never go to Taco Bell now, but when I was younger and I would, I would call it Taco Hell on the way there. And then, you know, that's just how we play. And, and I think that, that certain brands are able to go there with consumers and other brands aren't. Ultimately, a lot of brands are gonna have to, and it's gonna get even rougher. Like, I could see a time where I can't deal with it, right? Or it's too much for me. I just can't do it. Can you? I'm just kidding. I just, I just, there's young people in the audience that it's going to go to a space that, like, I think I'll be one of those. I'm just like, I don't get it. I need to step aside. Probably like three or four weeks from now. 
maybe a little bit like older people with ATM machines, where they're just not quite trusting mm -hmm. it, but a little bit. Yeah, where's the money coming from? <laughs> where's that? Are they printing it back there? Are there little people in there? Who's putting it through uh, the uh, slot? Um, I think uh, Alex has a couple more examples he, want, he wants to kind of yeah, talk got, about. Yeah, let's see. Let me read my hand. So we... we um, he literally does have hand writing on his hand. I don't have a memory except for ads, but not the order that the ads are in. So, so we, we did a campaign a while ago, and th this one, uh, I guess for me, is, is, that it is, is sort of an example of that, that there tends to be culturally different rules, um, and, there, and there tends to be um, what, uh, uh, what's the term that we use? Uh, rules and conventions around any category, right? So we had um, gotten some really neat uh, new results in terms of the safety of the, of the JETA. And we looked at the conventions of the category, and the conventions were such that you can't show safety except in two ways. One would be a car avoiding some stuff that fell off the back of a truck, right? Or, or crash test dummies. And it was, it was, you know, once you start to step out of your culture sometimes, you realize how rigid the rules are. And, and, and literally, those were the only ways. And, and also the avoiding hitting a cute animal. Is it, was but it's the device. same as the truck. Yeah, it's the same as the It's device. the theme, it's the same theme um, as the truck. But yes, there is a cute animal one. And, 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 and uh, so just, you know, when you, when you, we always try to step out of our own culture, because I think when you're in your culture, you believe it's right, you believe it's correct, but it's not correct, it's just sort of the way it is right now. And, and, uh, and, then, and, then you have the, and then you have the difference in what safety really means to consumers, and like we've all experienced accidents, right? And, and, and that experience was in stark contrast to the way the automotive companies presented this, this information. Um, and we felt that there was a dishonesty there, right? That, that, that car companies weren't just really being honest, and that's always been a hallmark of Volkswagen. So, so we thought, you know, would it be possible to portray, you know, what an accident really is like? And, and as we talked about it, and the, and the COGS or the planners did their work, there was like one phrase that came up like every time when you would recall right after an accident, everyone says, holy shit, right? And, and it, it's, a, it's weird that that's everyone's reaction. I shouldn't say it's everyone's reaction. It was my reaction and a lot of other people's reaction. So um, there was dozens and dozens of people's reaction. And, and uh, we thought there was, there, was, there was some truth to this. So, so we, uh, we, we took that and, and very carefully made this campaign that used some pretty lifelike accidents. And, uh, Everything had to be choreographed to the point that if anything went wrong or, or, or the cars didn't perform, nothing could air. So it was, again, it was a, a, a very um, bold experiment for the, for the client because we were going to shoot and spend a lot of money. You know how much shoots are. And if everything didn't go off exactly right, there was, there was no commercial. Um, and, and, the, and the accidents um, would be totally authentic. Um, so that was the premise going in, and, and uh, uh, we can roll the work that came out of that. And then while we're waiting, the, the, thing that, the thing that was interesting is we were very careful about where we put these, and, and there's, a different, there's a different acceptance in terms of what we'll accept in some forms of entertainment versus what we'll accept in advertising. So these were really startling for people, which I can understand, but it also was odd because we know where we put them. You know, they were on CSI, and you just saw somebody with, get their face cut off with a you know scalpel, and and then this freaked you out. But it is because culturally we have two different levels of, of uh, and and my belief is that that's not going to that's not going to last, right? The two are converging, and that's another part of this the theme behind this work. Most automobile safety ads relied on the same old formula, controlled collisions in controlled environments with simulated human beings, and always talked about avoiding the accident. This was the inspiration for Safe Happens. It just gives me the feeling like she's not like listening to me. Have you tried not saying like every other word? What? Remember your ski trip story? Yeah. I was like 
going down the hill and like this guy like cut me off and like there was a crowd no, and like come on, that's and not I was me. like look stuff either happens or it doesn't happen stuff doesn't sort of like happen <laughs> Holy. On the web, Safe took a more lighthearted turn as surfers managed to survive internet dings in the same way that drivers encounter surprises along the road. Boink. On banners that clicked right through to VWFeatures.com. At VWFeatures.com, shoppers lovingly customize their very own Jettas before using a menu to lovingly pulverize it in equally customizable short films. Letting safe happen just the way it should, in the most unexpected circumstances. Who cried? I did. Not me. I, I, it was a sad ending and everything. I just, it, I didn't I saw cry. you with your hand in your chin. That's called concentrating on the moment. It's more like holding your quivering upper lip. Exactly. <laughs> I wasn't crying, okay? I mean, seriously, I don't know why you... <laughs> Safe Happens ignited one of the most robust conversations of the year. And like any good conversation, it started with questions. But how many stars for the ad? Does it go to four? What in the world is VW trying to accomplish here? Many are calling the company, demanding to know if the actors sustained serious injuries. While talking heads talked, bloggers blogged, and critics critiqued, consumers, well, consumed. But the brand was listening and saw fit to respond with the 2006 Passat. So they're just driving along talking about whatever and suddenly, wham. I know, I saw it. Just think maybe they went too far. I think where they went was real. Yeah, but is it just shocking for the sake of shocking? But being, being in an accident isn't a shock. That's what they call it, an accident. Yeah, but you're watching TV, commercial comes on. From Times Square, this is Good Morning America. While some might question the tactics behind the new Volkswagen ads, there's no doubt they're working. After a disastrous 2005, sales are up this year by 20%. This is exactly the way accidents happen. It's perfectly captured. It breaks all the rules of advertising. Everybody's talking about it in the blogosphere and everywhere else, and sales are up. Dealers relayed anecdotes about customers entering dealerships describing, quote, those freaky Jetta commercials. On showroom floors across the country, the conversation had turned to safe. Safe happens. Proof that when safe becomes just as startling as danger, it magically becomes relevant. Thanks for watching. Uh, one question I had was the. It's kind of funny there, somebody's laughing and you, it was kind of like... Well, I mean, you could laugh at them, I guess, after, you know, you'd know that everyone's okay and everything. The, uh, was the, kind of the interactive component, which kind of did have a humor was lighter, to yeah. it. Was By design? Yeah, yes. absolutely, yeah. And, you know, we like to make configurators and then, you know, what's nice of, uh, is that if you have a lot of digital assets, you know, we've combined all our production into integrated production so that so that the art buyers and the and the print people and everybody when they're buying assets we can use them so so when we're creating um, three-dimensional still assets we can later take them into the website so we're able to do configurators that you can then animate the car that you just built in the film that hits the ufo and things like that and i have to deal with it after the fact of trying to negotiate that stuff yeah, or make assets twice, right. you know, which happens a lot because, you know, print doesn't know what, what broadcast or what, or what online is doing. So, yeah, those were, those were, those were fun. And um, I, I think that, that uh, they, they, anytime you do something like that, you know that the conversation is going to start off kind of negative, I think. But 
uh, and that's a lot of our work winds up in that space where people are arguing about whether, hey, is it okay to do that or is it not okay? And and uh, and if and I think we're, what we try to do is we try to know that in the end we think it's very justified. You know, we think it's more honest. We think that it's that it's that it's truer to what happens. And and the actors, you know, we would put a little bit of scuffs on their face because airbags can kind of kind of hurt you. The stunt people in the cars, they never even hit the airbags. And all that footage is of the actual people in the cars. There's no like CG or anything. Um, the, the restraints, those cars are amazing. And, and the restraints and the side curtains and everything, all that stuff went off so well that really no one had even a nick or an abrasion or anything. Um, so we felt very justified in, in, in doing it. You talked earlier about- And sales went up 20% like, like that. It was crazy. You talked earlier about kind of taking the conventions of the, the categories advertising and kind of turn, like really flipping it. Yeah. And um, what, do you, what do you think about kind of the, the insurance category, which is, used to be such a super serious category and it always had like a stag on a mountain and protection and umbrellas and all that type of thing. And now you look at a category, pretty much everyone in that category is really following Geico's lead in terms of kind of leading with humor. Mm -hmm. um, there, I think you're, you're taking serious in, in humor and you're taking humor, because humor is often used a lot of times in automotive advertising, and really flipping it. That's your, what, do you th what are the categories have you noticed that in where you, you've seen something that's really flipped the category advertising norms on, on their heads, so to speak? I, th you know, I think it's, I, I don't so much look at it happening. I, I tend to look at it more in terms of what categories can you borrow from if right, only because I'm not a huge fan of advertising, I don't follow advertising that much. So the only time I notice is if I'm charged with doing something. So in so in the case of burgers, I looked at burgers and I thought, why isn't burger advertising? You know, if you look at the audience, why isn't it more akin to beer advertising? Right. So uh, so my feeling was that it that it could be, should be, and and probably probably would be, and uh, and and I think you know. Burger King is, is, has started that, and I think in some ways every now and then I see McDonald's answering, and the category has gotten, gotten to be a lot more fun. Definitely has evolved. Yeah. I have to say, especially in the last, I want to say, four to five years, that it's, people are, I, the, I think the categories learn that you can have fun with it, versus yeah. being, it's always going to be a bite and smile shot where some unbelievably beautiful actress is, is biting a burger, and it's like the best moment in her life, and there's such a falsity to that, I think, in many, yeah. you know, many, Things. And I think that's it works. I mean, the like Paris Hilton eating the burger. Carl's, worked for me. Like, that worked that, that worked for good, uh, most you know? of the guys in the audience, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. it's not the kind of work we do. <laughs> we would have someone in a chicken suit. What's that? Yeah, yeah. They, uh, you, Carl's gets uh, Paris Hilton. I get RuPaul. That's what I get. And there it is. <laughs> um, I think you're going to talk about it, one, another one of your. I will. Brands. I will. Next, He's going I've to the hand. Got, I've got. Uh, um, this is this is one that's uh, probably a little bit about mining your 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 uh, your intellectual properties from the past, and and we tend to do that anytime we get involved with the br uh, brand. Bringing the king back, I think, was part of that, right? The, it was a little crazy to us that there was this brand, Burger King, and the king had been, you know, a bullet had been put in his head, and he was never to come back, and. And so we knew right away we'd bring him back at some point. We just didn't know how. And then, and then I, I actually had this crew that would buy stuff online from, and I was starting a Burger King museum. And uh, one of the things they found was this fiberglass head that used to go on top of the uh, um, balloons thing to inflate the balloons. There was a little hole in the mouth. And we would put that on, and we'd like walk around the office with the fiberglass <laughs> head on. And uh, we, you know, we just got a huge kick out of it, probably for a year before we, you know, um, thought, okay, now we've got this assignment to bring the king back. And we thought of all sorts of different ways, and finally we're like, that fiberglass head is fun, you know, let's do that. Anyway, this has nothing to do with that. But <laughs> it's an example of what this is. And, and uh, when we started working with Domino's, we, we noticed that, that so much of of their DNA was was wrapped up in this idea of 30 minutes or it's free, right? And at one point, um, 
they had to move away from that because uh, there, there were some, some lawsuits and, and some things that happened where um, people had, uh, had uh, thought that drivers were driving too fast to try to make that 30 minute time, right? So, so yet yeah, delivery at the same time culturally had gained so much momentum. You saw delivery and, 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 uh, and FedEx and, and buying things online getting all this momentum, yet the sort of pizza delivery experts had lost a lot of momentum. So we thought, is there a way to capture that, that, that DNA, but, but do it in such a way that, that, uh, that instead of um, a guarantee, it was more of a, of a gift of time? Because we found that you know it, it actually is people use it so that okay I've I've ordered the pizza now I can wash the dog or now I can do these other things and it sort of allows me to adjust the time in my day so I just have two two spots that that help launch this this uh, this theme line for for Domino's and they'll just run one after another. Thirty minutes, great. Hey, Domino's. Hey. Guess what I did with my 30 minutes. 30 minute abs? Uh-huh. <laughs> mm. Domino's, you got 30 minutes. Okay. Hey, honey. The uh, Domino's lady just said we've got 30 minutes. You think what I'm thinking? What are we gonna do with the other 28 minutes? <laughs> you got a hot pizza, you got it to your door. Domino's. Do I hear, do I hear a side of pity minutes. out there somewhere? Yeah, someone was like, oh. oh. I heard that. Uh, quick, just a quick question, not specifically related to that, just the fact that you handle um, you, what some would consider a conflict between Domino's and Burger King. How are you able to, and how are you able to continue to navigate that? I don't, you know, I don't really believe in conflicts. I think that you know they exist in the advertising world. We've sort of, you know, bought into this notion that that you would somehow, or for some reason, do a different job on one thing. You know, attorneys don't really have this within their profession, and a lot of other professions don't have it. So, in in Japan, um, you know, Dentsu handles five different car brands or whatever it is. So, uh, you know, you put, you put a certain amount of firewalls up in between things. Um, but the notion that you'd be less professional and, and less diligent, uh, I think, is just pretty much nonsense. Is it a little bit also kind of a, uh, a tip of the hat to the fact of your, your, your agency's brand strength that um, you're Part of it is that clients are so eager to work with you that they will look past certain things they would maybe not look past with other agencies. That could be. There's also some, some you know, shared board members or something. So, you know. So there's a. And I don't think they really compete. You know, you haven't, you don't really find that pizza and and fast food really compete very often. They're pretty different occasions. But I just, you know, I just think. Uh, if I could, if I could do anything in advertising and and then die, it would be do away the, with the notion of conflicts because I I just don't think they're real. So I'm doing what I can, and and uh, I don't want to die quite yet. <laughs> Nor do we, especially here right now. Not right now, <laughs> not on stage. It'd be so embarrassing. <laughs> so so should I show another thing? Yeah yeah because we're gonna. We're going to carve out the last half hour. Yeah, wow, so I'm going to have a couple hour. questions, and then I'm going to open it up to the floor for about a half hour. So, so th tonight. this thing is, you know, years years ago we we um, uh, launched a, a campaign, an anti-tobacco campaign called Truth, and and uh, um, Truth started in in Florida and and uh, became a national thing, and uh, we shared it with Arnold uh, out of Boston. Uh, Awesome, awesome agency, and uh, Pete Favat was uh, sort of my my uh, co-creative director on that, and and the uh, guy who who uh, I just get along with really well, and, and we're kind of the same person. Have you ever met a person that's exactly like you? That that happened to me, and and we found that we could be in a meeting, and he could do it, or I could do it, and you know I let him creative direct my people, and vice versa, and it was it was really nice. This has nothing to do with that. Um, 
But what it does have to do is we, we, through truth, we actually shot a lot of hidden camera stuff. And I still get off on hidden camera stuff. And, and I think partly because it's just, it makes things real, right? And again, the idea of proving something rather than just saying it, it, it's just, there's nothing like hiding some cameras and doing it. And it's also super fun because, you know, something like Whopper Freakout, you're in the van and you're watching, and you're like, oh my God, what's gonna happen? And, and you, you try to script these things, um, but they always come out much better than you can imagine they're going to come out. And so, uh, you know, we've done it enough now. We can say to clients, like, hey, here's the script. We hope that it'll be something like this. It's actually going to be cooler. Um, and this one was for uh, Coke Zero. And we were launching Coke Zero in the, in the US. And, and uh, the thing about Coke Zero, if you've had it, is it actually tastes a lot like Coke, right? And it's kind of crazy. Um, because it, I actually think it tastes like, you know when you go and get department or uh, like supermarket Coke or supermarket cola, right? It kind of tastes like Coke, but it's still, you know, that's how close this is. It doesn't taste diet, it's just like, you should all go get some. Like a six pack, after we leave here, go get some. But it's really good. But that's an impossible, again, it's an impossible thing to say. So we were thinking, in a world where this would be true, and in a world like ours that's very litigious, what would happen if, if, a, a diet product tastes just like the, 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 real, the real thing. And so we, we set up this idea where we um, wanted to get attorneys, bring them in, and, and convince them that Coke wanted to sue uh, Coke Zero. And what was fun about it was we're so litigious, you knew it was just, it was that close to happening, right? Uh -huh. I mean, like, if we didn't do it soon, a we would read about a company suing itself, right? And I'm sure within the next three years, we'll read about a company suing itself. It's just, there's just so many lawyers, we know this is going to happen. So that, that felt like a good, a good, we were in a good spot to kind of launch this. And so we, uh, we do, what we always do in these cases is, is we bring in some actors. The actors are posing as employees of Coke. We, Call, you know, call a lot of attorneys out of the phone book. And you know, the attorneys are excited because it's like, I got a meeting with Coke. This is huge, right, if you're in Atlanta, <laughs> right? So they're coming. They're going to show up. And, and, uh, and, and usually we'll throw in, because you, know, you don't want to, it's a production. You don't want to get nothing, right? So you always throw in like a ringer or two. OK, you're going to act as the, the actors won't know that you're an actor, but you're going to act as the attorney and you know, kind of do your thing. Ringer stuff, we never, ever use it. So um, there were some ringers, ne never used it. The real attorneys are awesome because I think they want the job, right? They want to believe that there is a case somewhere in here, but they just can't figure it out. Um, so so uh, this, next, this next little uh, um, film sort of shows that. There's a law of beverages as ironclad as any law of physics. Diet colas never taste like the real thing. Instead, they have this vaguely chemical quasi-cola taste that society has grudgingly accepted as the best modern beverage technology can do. Enter Coca-Cola Zero, a zero-calorie cola that does the unthinkable. It actually tastes like regular Coke. So how do you convince a hyper-skeptical market that a drink with no calories actually can taste like regular Coke? Well, seeing as this is the 21st century, the first thing you do is file a lawsuit. Or more accurately, you have two actors posing as Coke executives recruit real attorneys to help them sue Coke Zero, a division of their own company, for stealing real Coke taste. We represent the Coke brand. We would like to sue Coca-Cola Zero. Would you say that we have a case? For what? For taste infringement. We want to just sue them back to the Stone Age to send a message that they're tampering with, really, the flagship of the company. It's one company. It's like you suing yourself. Yeah, but, but they're on a different part of our floor. Da, 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 da. We represent the Coke brand, and we would love to somehow bring some kind of legal action against Coke Zero. There might be some taste infringement issues. Oh, so you're worried about... I think it's basic taste infringement. I'd like to stick with that phrase, because that okay, sounds really good to me. It's not a claim. It's not a claim. Could we sue them just to get it in the court to to just just humiliate It'll be these people. It'll be, we, you'll be humiliated and you'll we'll be fired. We'll be humiliated and, and fired. And you'll get fired. I don't want that. 
da, 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 da. You captured this misguided legal adventure on hidden camera, and you turn the resulting footage into TV spots, viral videos, and media-rich banners that link back to a website filled with related content. I'm an immigration lawyer. The head of the Coke Zero team's Canadian. Could we have him deported? Like the handy Sue a Friend online tool, which allowed visitors to sue people who might be copying their taste. Users simply scrolled down to choose an infraction, selected a law firm, and clicked send. Moments later, the guilty party received a terse missive on legal letterhead threatening a lawsuit if the taste theft continued. Then you turn the two actors loose inside Coca-Cola headquarters. Between these and the cost of the tent and the cards, we're sort of out of money. You know, a lot of people say kids need braces. I say let it work itself out naturally, in my house anyway. This is more important than that. Yeah. Where they attempt to sow dissent among the 7,000 employees of the Coca-Cola company, many of whom believe the two men really work for Coke. You even craft an internal email from the two bogus executives to the entire company. But you don't stop there, because, well, this is a very litigious society we live in, and if Coke Zero really did taste like regular Coke, consumers might be confused as to which is which. The perfect recipe for a class action lawsuit, spearheaded by the fictitious ambulance-chasing firm of Covet and Yormany. Radio spots urged listeners to call one 877 0 if they recently consumed a Coca-Cola Zero, only to find themselves recklessly refreshed by the real taste of Coke. Hello, I'm Dale Yormany. If you could swear you were enjoying regular Coke from a can of Coke Zero, call the law offices of Covet and Yormany today. While outdoor boards, truck wraps, and fractional print ads used up the remainder of the intentionally small Covet and Yormany ad budget. In the end, it all made for quite the cultural tornado. In the cola wars of the 1990s, Coke and Pepsi fought for the consumer dollar. But the new cola wars may be Coke against Coke. In a new ad campaign, two classic Coke executives want to sue their Coke Zero colleagues for what's called taste infringement. From the mainstream media to the murky depths of the international blogosphere, people were willingly, happily caught up in the storm. Many who approached the Coca-Cola company with disdain became new and passionate fans. Like this guy, who wrote, The Coca-Cola company has never really spoken to me in the last 15 years. However, I've been taken by surprise by this fine viral idea of company foolery. Not surprisingly, the new Nielsen system for rating cultural buzz revealed Coke Zero as, quote, the most blogged about packaged good in the study, mentioned at 100 times the rate of the next closest packaged good and at the same rate as Barack Obama's newly released biography, unquote. Best of all, when the dust from this campaign finally settled, everyone knew one thing for sure. Coke Zero does, in fact, taste a lot like regular Coke. One, one thing that, that is interesting about that is that uh, it, there was, it actually broke online. So it, so it migrated from a viral online campaign to broadcast ultimately, which is interesting because I think sometimes clients are nervous about things and, uh, and a little less nervous about putting them online. And so we found that, you know, that can be a great outlet for some, some cool work that eventually bubbles up, up from there. <clears throat> was the part of it... Uh maybe not uh, unwritten, is the fact that par part of the humor is that Coke's just this big, humongous, behemoth soda company, yeah. that there's this kind of dumbness about them that they would actually I don't think, think? I don't think a dumbness, but I think there was, there's a, there's a, a corporateness you know, that you perceive, and so that, you know, that large corporate kind of vibe could be turned, and, and I think that's what, uh, what made it fun. It would be like not, in, not every company could sue itself and have us kind of believe it because they just don't have the scale or the size. And actually, and, and Zero is now what they call a mega brand. So it's, uh, it's been, I think it's, it's been really successful. Yeah. And that's what we go. I mean, that's another thing. It's like people ask how do you measure success? And for us, it's always sales because, you know, there's all sorts of ad tracking things and different metrics you can use, but we, we figure we're going to get fired if we don't get sales kind of working. So we always use sales. Speaking as a client, that's usually true. You will fire us, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I read a quote, I believe it was in the Fast Company article, um, and I think it was attributed to you or someone in your agency, and it was, it's part of your job as a marketer to find the truth in a company, and you let them shine through in whatever weird way it might be. A couple of 
interesting moments there, as you say, as marketers versus ad agencies. Mm -hmm. And secondly, just this um, challenge to find, I guess, that, that truth nugget of what a brand is. What, what is your process to try to find that? Is it just studying up on the brand itself and just seeing what's there? It is there? Usually, I mean, it's always different with every brand, you know. So, um, but usually the DNA of a brand, um, for whatever, it, it's, it's really mysterious in, in a way. You've got to go back to the real inception of the company and the personalities that were there and the combination of people and, and the dynamics that were in place will, 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 will work their way into the brand, will work their way into the DNA, and they never come out. So, so you really have to do your history. And, and, and I don't really even understand why that is. Like, it doesn't totally make sense, does it, that, that the founders of Burger King and what they were like actually are important to what the brand is like now. In some ways, I can't make sense of it, but it's always true. So you've got to do a ton of homework. And, and, I, and I think most agencies go out and they talk to consumers and they ask consumers, what do you think the brand is? That's part of our process, but it's, it really is just a part. Uh, you know, a big part is the, is the historical um, look at the brand and the historical understanding. So something like Volkswagen, the, the, the uh, Max right now, um, Max, Max is, uh, really because is is around and is and is the voice of Volkswagen because the the DNA um, for Americans dried so long ago the cement that makes up the Volkswagen brand dried a long time ago and it dried in an erroneous way um, where we think of Volkswagen as sort of this cute SoCal niche brand right very youthful SoCal niche brand and, and it's the third largest automaker in the world um, and, and when, when someone in Europe looks at an original Beetle, they see a very different connection that goes from, the, from, from that time now, and it's all about engineering. We see this thing stuck in an era. So, you know, we kind of need to, to go back into that past, bring back this icon, and then recontextualize all around him so that, that we could kind of break that cement up and make you see the lineage. Um, because as Americans, we don't see it. Well, it is the patriarch of the Volkswagen brand, as, as people in the United States know it. Um, is there some fear that it's lost and some, of the, some younger consumers are not as intimate with the bug? It, 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 no. I mean, it's, it's come up as a, as a, as a potential um, watch out, but they're, they're, um, we can't find it at all. I mean, everyone relates to the, to the bug. Well, it's an, it's an iconic shape. I remember. But um, we think of it as Herbie, right? So if you if you looked at the bug, you would think that the bug has a Southern California accent, right? That that's where he grew up, grew up, and that's his thing. And that's you know we kind of need to fix that. He's German. He's got a German accent. <laughs> his name's Max. His right? name is Max. Yeah. yeah, it's not Herbie. I read uh, a long time ago, having worked on the agency side on car business myself, and how kind of myopic some automotive companies can become the fact that it's very insular industry where very, very rarely do they, they hire outside of automotive people when, they, when they're bringing people in, especially at senior levels. Um, but I did read an article where you challenged them, they were thinking of changing the name of the Jetta. And you, I read you stood up in a meeting and said, why would you lose all this equity you have? And it was, it was the Jetta, correct? I don't, I don't think I did that. I think- um, So your evil twin? It could have been. I think, well, there, we'd, we'd changed the golf back to the rabbit. That's what it was. That Sorry. could have been it, yeah. So the, so, so the uh, yeah, when we looked at, we looked at sales data, um, from the time the rabbit became the golf, sales just went like this, from 250,000 units to like 30,000 units, and then changed the name back. And we did some nice advertising, but you know, for me, I think it was really people realizing that it was, names are so important. I mean, you cannot um, overestimate the power of a name, I don't think. Um, and, and so the minute we changed it back to, to, uh, to Rabbit, the next year we sold 50,000 cars and really could have sold more. We just can't get more in. Because people want to have a relationship with a Rabbit, you know? Hard to have a relationship with a Golf. <laughs> we, we did a lot of research. There were, there were still Golf passionate golf or uh, rabbit communities, but there were no golf communities that, you know, other than like actual golf communities. There's probably a club. I mean, it's well, probably it means a club of rabbit It people. means golf, like Gulfstream. Mm -hmm. But here, yeah, here it means golf. 
And then it's further confused by the fact that then the shifter is like a golf ball, which didn't help. And you got a car targeted towards young people, named after an old person's game. No offense to anyone who loves golf. This is probably a big golf area, San Diego, yeah. right? It is. I think it is the second most golf courses per capita in the country after. I played golf a couple Arizona, times. I want to say, right? Yeah. All right, a couple questions. Uh, Evil Knievel, what is your obsession with Evil Knievel? I don't, that, you know, that, that Fast Company article, did you read that? It's, it's so full of errors and, and just complete hype. Um, I don't have any fascination with Evil Knievel. And then they asked me for the picture of the poster of Evil Knievel in my office, and I don't think there is one, so we're like, I don't think we can send just you that. Made, the guy was just making it up to make an issue. I, I think Evil Knievel is really cool, and he's the father of, grandfather of extreme sports, you know, props, but um, I don't have an infatuation. Microsoft has been literally attacked by Apple uh, the last few years uh, with this, the great, you know, award-winning campaign starring, uh, I forget the actors' names, but um, I was everyone's familiar with the campaign. Why do you think it's taken so long for Microsoft to actually either thinking about retorting or just sitting back and taking it for so long? Is it hubris or just the fact that they didn't feel they were being dented at all? I can't comment on Microsoft. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good question. It was an me. excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been doing a little digging. I know, you know, having an advertising background. I heard one of the reasons uh, that you moved to the Colorado was that you were having trouble recruiting established, creative, and especially uh, smart people to Miami because of the the cost of the market as well as the the reputation of the market not being really family oriented. Is that true? I read online that it was because they had better weed there. <laughs> and, We know they do. I don't know. I really, I'd have no problem with it, but I don't partake. You know, I'm not, that's not my thing. But um, I, think that, I think that that was one of the, the nice aspects of the move is what, what we said to people is you can be either place. And, and uh, which actually seems like a gift. You know, we're like said to the staff, we're going to move with a few people over time. You can decide, you can live, you can have this lifestyle, you can have this lifestyle. It's the cruelest thing you can do to a person, is give them a choice like that. And I had no idea, because what happens is they have to sort of own it. You know, it's sometimes easier to say, you're moving here. And then people are like, OK, got to move here. And uh, so it really made people really miserable. But um, now they're OK. So we have about 400 people in Boulder and about uh, 400 people in Miami. We're kind of split 50-50. Um, favorite agencies, not yours. What are some of your favorite agencies or agency out there and some of the work they do and, and why do you think you're, why you respect them and what you like about their, some of their work? I, you know, for me, I sort of mentioned it before, is I like when the form changes of advertising. And, and, and so um, I can remember uh, not, not being interested in advertising, but being a kid and, and uh, watching TV and I would see something and I, would, and I would think, wow, advertising could be that. Um, and I'd see something else, and I'd think, wow, advertising could be that. I had no idea. And usually that work was done by, by uh, Shiat and Wyden. You know, to, for me, um, when I was younger, they, they, they were the ones. And Shiat over and over and over, and, and things like when Wyden did uh, Lou Reed for Honda scooters. You know, just most of you don't remember this work. It's a long time ago. I actually remember when, when and I, I don't, advertising is funny because you don't even, it's so of the moment, right? It's, it, and, and I like that about it. It's, it doesn't have any shelf life. But when, why, are, who's beeping? What? Sorry. There's a bomb. Um, remember the Pizza Hut campaign that Chiat did? And it was like Roseanne Barr and somebody yes. else, and they'd just be talking and eating pizza. I remember that was kind of startling. Now it'd be hard to put yourself back in the place where that would be startling. but. Anyway, they, you know, their reinvention of the form I really respect. Um, quick advertising question in terms of just the, the, uh, the category itself. Will you be watching Mad Men on Sunday night? I have not seen it. Not. I have not seen it. Is it good? 
Yeah. yeah I think, I think it's Last a great time show. I watched uh, TV, I saw 30 something. And uh, <laughs> it was, there was, you know, Miles Drentel was the creative director, if you recall. Yeah. Yeah. I don't watch a lot of TV. Basically, I watch What Not to Wear because my wife <laughs> TiVos and there's like 3,000 on a day. And so that's the only thing on the TiVo. It kicks all my shit off the TiVo, no, no matter how much work I do to try to program it. And so, yeah, I watch a lot of What Not to Wear. So and it's not working, so. So at the beginning, I mentioned your, your, um, some of your people talking about how you're always injured coming into the office on Monday. What do you do on the weekends that? I, I, my whole thing now is not to be injured anymore. I think the, the part of me thought it was kind of cool to get injured because it showed that like what you were doing was sort of tough. And I've gotten injured enough that I'm really not into injury at all. Um, and, and, uh, but I, do, I still like to do the same things, you know, a little motocross, uh, you know, downhill mountain biking, some, some backcountry skiing, but without injury. Okay. Well, I'm going to lead into the last uh, segment here where we're going to open it up to the audience. But since this feels so much like the actor studio and James so Lipton, I'm going to ask the famous 10 question uh, from shit. Lipton that he, he riffed off from Bernard Pivo after, after, of a Proust questionnaire. I should have prepared for this. Right. What is your favorite word? Whew, I like kumquat a lot. <laughs> I'll go with kumquat. I don't I like riparian as well. Riparian? Yeah. It's a good word. It's a nice word. What is your least favorite word? I'm going to say something stupid, so I think I'll just avoid it. I'll be like, hate. No. Um, <laughs> least favorite word? I don't, I don't know. I don't really have any problem with any of the words. Uh, this, this, <laughs> this is cool beans a... is my least favorite phrase. Cool beans? Cool beans, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't have to be Sucks, word. It right? could be, it mean, could be phrase. It could be phrase. Could it be phrase? It okay. Be phrase. When someone says cool beans, it's just so annoying, right? <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, what turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Mm. What turns me on? <sighs> you should answer this. It was coming. I didn't know that they were going to ask this sort of thing. Spiritually, what turns me on is... Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm not getting turned on enough, you know? Okay. Yeah. Uh, what? No. Are you trying to turn me on? No, I'm not. <laughs> I, I could be doing it by accident, but I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, what turns you off creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Uh, fear. I really, um, that's the thing that I think creatively is, is you can always, fear ruins work. Well, you know, whether you're a fine artist, and if you've ever done any fine art, if you've got fear of the canvas or whatever, it, it ruins things. And, and I think that uh, any time you, you, you work with a culture that's, that's fear-based, and sometimes, you know, corporately there are those cultures out there, and, you know, you run into them from time to time, um, nothing wonderful is going to happen when, when people are afraid. Uh, what sound or noise do you love? I like the sound of the, of the ground in Colorado a lot. Like, even when I was a kid and, and we'd take vacations, there's something about when you take a step, there's a certain mixture of, of little rocks and pebbles and earth and, 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 and dry uh, grass, and it fucking sounds awesome. <laughs> and, and I still get off on it, and, and every step is different. Than, than the one before. So it's just never ending pleasure for me. Uh, what sound or noise That's pretty do you weird. Hear? Is that weird or no, is that okay? I don't okay? think so. I don't think no. so. It's okay? No, I think it's, it's fine. It's, it's fine. fine. Okay. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> what sound or noise do you hate? Hmm. Yeah, I probably hate car alarms. What is your favorite curse word? I think the F bomb is like, that's the. <laughs> I like horseshit a lot, but it's a compound <laughs> curse word. It's kind of not a curse word, because you can almost say it on TV. Horseshit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what profession, other than your own, would you like to attempt? Um, I'm, I'm, that's a really, that's, 
I feel like in, in, in what I do, I'm able to kind of move around a little bit. So uh, right now we're, we're doing more with industrial design. And that was what I originally wanted to do when I was a kid. I wanted to be an industrial designer. And my dad, you know, he took me aside and he said, you'll never do that. You're not talented enough. <laughs> um, it's really, it's really difficult, and the people that do that, they're, they're, they're amazingly talented and smart, and you should just kind of, before you get started, back off. And, um, and so it's a nice way to, you know, sort of fly the finger to my dad, kind of bring in a little industrial design, do you could, something you I You could like. say that's kind of, that was a bunch of horse shit, is what you could the say. The horse shit pop. <laughs> uh, no, he's happy for me. Yeah. What profession yeah. would you? They had very low expectations for me, and I actually t I talked to him about it the other day. I was like, "Why didn't you guys like even think to pony up the money to send me to college, or you know?" Because I said, "Hey, it's time to go to think about college." You know, the other kids at school are thinking about college, and they're like, "Yeah, <laughs> can you afford it?" And I, I'm like, "No, I'm a kid. I have no money." And they're like, "Well, I don't see you going to college then." <laughs> Um, and I said, to, I said to my mom, I was like, why were there you know, just no expectations for me? Because eventually my mom taught me to do mechanicals, and that's how I got into advertising. And she said, there were just no signs, honey. Like, just... <laughs> it does. It, was... it says a lot. And she's right. Yeah. There were no signs. Uh, what profession would you not like to do? Hmm. Uh, probably lawyering. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, last question. This one's a little way existentialist, but uh, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? God, I actually answered this once, and I had a really good answer, and I can't remember it now. I couldn't find it online. No. no. Maybe I dreamed it. <laughs> um, what would I want him to say when I got to the pearly gates? What's that? Welcome. Welcome would be, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know what I'd like him to say is like, you just barely got in. <laughs> that way you know you lived enough of the other bit, you know? You did it right. Yeah, you ringed it for all it yeah. had. <laughs>